There she is taking my job. <laughs> it's happening. It's already no, no, happening. no, lady, Zoom lady. I want your job. I'm coming for it. Um, he's not quite there yet. Abel James, how are you? I'm I'm doing quite well, but even better now that I'm talking to you. It's it's nice to hang out virtually. It is. Uh, it's even better in person, but this will have to do for right now. <laughs> this will have to do. I need to get my butt <laughs> over to Austin because I need to see Absolutely. you. I need to see Allison, and I need to eat all the brisket. brisket. All the brisket, the fattiest, moistest brisket ever. It's the best in the Who world. Who doesn't choose the fatty end of the brisket? Who are these monsters? I used to be one of those monsters. Oh, I used to God. when I first came to to Texas way back in the day. I said, "Give me the lean meat." And You're like, uh, all right, sucker. That was here. You go. <laughs> that was pre fat burning man. That's when I was carrying the extra fat. Oddly enough, and uh, so there's mm. no turning back now. It's nothing but the fattiest, moistest brisket. From here on forth. And it's, in fact, largely one of the reasons that we moved back to Texas because of the, the foodie culture. It's not just the brisket. It's an amazing I mean, a lot culture. of it is. A lot of it's the brisket. But no, it's the foodie culture. It's In some parts of the country, people don't really care or they just go out to restaurants sometimes and it's not really a thing. In other parts of the country, food is life. And people have backyard barbecues and they just love cooking. They love sharing. And uh, I know, obviously, that's that's what you're into. And it's one of the reasons I love uh, Central Texas and, and all of Texas, really, and, and a lot of the South, where I know <laughs> you have a lot of experience, too. But it's kind of a Southern thing in, yeah. in a lot of ways where you just have those backyard barbecues. You share food. You make fun of each other. You talk. You do those old school <laughs> human things that no one does anymore in real life. Eating, connecting, enjoying yourselves. It matters. It matters. It really does matter. Yeah. You know, it is interesting because food food is life for me, obviously. Um, and but I love nothing more than to go to gatherings where everybody's so excited to share with me what they've made. And and I gotta say, I have created a lifestyle where people are excited to share what they've made with me because that's what I do for a living. <laughs> and so right. but then I get the best of it because I don't have to do anything as long as I don't have to work, you know what I mean? <laughs> then it's mm -hmm. I love tasting what other people have created and it just it makes me so happy. And I I do love working out, but I'm not like I don't have like a sports hobby. I don't like play tennis mm -hmm. or pickleball. I don't play golf. I don't do those kind of things. My hobby and my job is food. Mm -hmm. so it's it's V important to me. And it's um, pretty awesome, but it is a lost art in, in some ways. It is. it is. And and barbecuing in particular is like an incredible art. Butchering and <sighs> smoking I and barbecuing and doing all the things. I, I have mad respect because I make I make some briskets myself and um I've been I've messed up a brisket or two in my day. Yeah, and that is it's, humbling, isn't it? When you have a gorgeous giant piece of meat. I was gonna say there were almost tears involved, but yeah. humbling is the right word. Yeah. Well, it's they all have their own secrets here, and I am far from a pit moss pit master, especially when you're talking about the Texans and, and the Southerners who are real pit masters. But I'm just a little baby as it comes to that. I've smoked a couple of meats. Uh, I do a little bit of barbecuing, but mostly like to your point, it's it's more fun when you can go to different people's places. And some of them are restaurants, like getting to know the people who own the restaurants and barbecue places around here uh, is is a great deal of fun. But shifting that uh, cooking responsibility from one house or one party to the next is really important. And the BYOB and, and BYO food type thing mm -hmm. is something that I grew up with, but I feel like- yeah it doesn't exist like it used to so much. Right. And I really, I really do miss it. And it's it's such a critical part of being human and making cooking and eating more enjoyable because it's splitting it up to the whole tribe, the whole community. And that's how it should be. But it's like, now we're the odd ducks. We're the weird health nuts. And we're the only ones who cook anymore is what it feels <laughs> like sometimes. It, it's very true. And, and it's interesting because I feel like my whole vibe is I, I basically learned how to cook from two places, from the ladies who bring the food to the church potluck Yep. I grew up, my mom's a minister <laughs> and, uh, and the, then working for a catering company. So you learn to cut, you know, 4,000 bell peppers in a certain way and you just get practice at it. Right. Yep. And I didn't go to culinary school. I did, you know, i obviously love to cook and all this. So it's, it is interesting. And, and you brought up something that I thought was important that I think people are sometimes afraid to do, which is to go into restaurants and talk to the proprietors, talk to the chefs, make a human connection because yeah. 
they want to serve. They want to make you. So if you're the health nut and you're like, Hey, I'm trying to do this thing and not have processed sugars and grains. And I want to do the wild diet, but I have to eat at this restaurant. You'd be shocked how much they want to provide that for you. They don't want to be jerks and kick you out of the restaurant. Yeah. To keep it on the point of brisket. One of the guys who, who owns a restaurant, um, the barbecue place here in town, he comes locally and has like a community event over here and shares some barbecue and whatever. And one guy was asking him, He's just like, is it a secret how you make the best brisket ever? He's like, no, no, no. I'll tell you everything. You just got to do this and this and that. And then you don't take it out at 165. You got to take it out at 160 and let it rest. And it goes up in temperature a little bit. And then it's got all the smart. And so it's it's not this secret thing where everyone's keeping it hold the, close to the chest in a lot of cases. It's a, it's really a fun thing for people. They want you to get as into it as they are. They want you to get the bug too, because they know how much fun it can be to really go down that rabbit hole and enjoy it and then share it with your family. So it's, yeah, I love it when people kind of find that whatever that thing is, whether it's making yogurt or a sauerkraut or uh, that, that one, just start with one meal that you can cook for other people. That's what the bachelors did back in the day. That's, that's how I did it. It's just like, learn how to make one thing, and then learn how to make another thing. Then learn how. To, then you've got like three to six different things, and you can kind of show off. Hey, I can make one heck of a chicken parm, or I can. Yeah, I can handle breakfast. Or oh, you you want me to throw some salmon on the grill? Yeah, I, th I think I could do that. Let's do the marinade first. And it's men. I hope you're listening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It works. Exactly, but <laughs> you don't have to learn how to do everything, and you don't have to go to culinary school, especially yeah. these days. But if you can just learn a couple of those quick little short order cook things even if it's just learning how to make some scrambled eggs make a decent breakfast and cook up bacon in, in your favorite way learn how to do that and it's especially now i'm sure you can you can relate it's uh gonna save you a lot of money a lot of money and a lot of time actually when you when you add oh all my that god so much i mean listen i'm not gonna get my own chickens anytime soon because that's a pain in the ass yeah but i thought about it with the eggs the way that sure. they're priced these days oh good gracious <laughs> There, well, I, I read it, some article that they had to steal the eggs. Somebody was stealing the smug, no, not stealing, smuggling, smuggling the eggs. Yeah, I heard <laughs> about this. So they just destroy them, which makes it worse. It's, it's a strange thing. But it's yeah, now the world. cheapest stuff is becoming more like the most expensive because everyone's rushing for the cheapest stuff, which is driving right. up the cost of the cheap stuff. And it's it's hairy. I don't it know. Is hairy it, out there. Being a health nut is being. How do you there do it? You. How do what? How do you prioritize how you like to eat? And just for reference, if if I know I already introed you, but for reference, everybody, Abel and I share a very similar, if not close to identical philosophy about, very for the close, most part, yeah. keep out the processed foods and seed oils, yep. and then eat meats and veg and fruit and nuts and. I know you eat dairy. Sometimes I do, even though I've been told not to. <laughs> Whatever. Right. I don't listen to everything that's told to me. <laughs> I don't either. But how <laughs> but how do how do you in this day how do you plan for that? Because we're all not made of money. No, we're not. Well, I was talking to Allison, my wife, last night about this, and we had a, a sirloin steak, and I think it was 16 bucks. Uh, and we split it. It's like that's kind of a lot because I it came out, it wasn't a full pound, like I think the full pound price might have been. For a sirloin, that seems high. But yeah, for, grass but fed, compared to grass like a ribeye. Which yeah, now ribeyes are like 40 bucks a pound. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it was 24 a pound. And we're always going for those cheaper cuts of meat. And uh, it was very delicious. And it wasn't quite enough for me because I had just like worked out and, and I hadn't really eaten a big meal that day or anything. And I was, I was really hungry, but it was absolutely delicious. So much less than spending what $74 for a serving a steak at some restaurant or right. over a hundred dollars. If you want a really big steak, whatever it is. Um, but then I compared that to the cost of, you know, salmon or something. It's like $24 a pound for salmon, wild caught or whatever. That that might even be on the lower end these right. days. That's that's an expensive protein. Chicken breast, same deal. But uh, we also got six or eight pounds of grass-fed, grass-finished ground beef, which was, mm -hmm. I don't know, 7 or $8 a pound. We could have well, gotten, that good. was from the grocery store. That's yeah, we could have gotten it for a lot less if we went to a ranch, which we do sometimes as well. And uh and then as well, if you look at like chicken breast, for example, we're talking 12 plus dollars a 
pound. All, all of this will be complete. I hope you're posting this right away because next year it'll be like a hundred dollars a pound for chicken breast. Or something. <laughs> They'll be like, like remember, are going. remember when it was only twelve bucks a chicken breast? <laughs> oh my god! But the uh, the chicken drumsticks four dollars a pound, right. and yeah, that includes the bones and the skins and the tendons. But th that's the good stuff. That's the collagen. Right. You can make your own broth after that. So it's really about finding the less marketed, less sexy pieces mm -hmm. of meat and saving money that way. And if most of your calories are coming from meats and oils, which for us, they are not necessarily food volume, but food calories are, and you need right. to fill up on something, then, uh, you know, what's the difference between having a steak for $24 a pound or having a whole bunch of hamburgers or ground beef at right. seven or $8 a pound. And in terms of money, it's a massive difference. In terms of how much you could fill up, well, you can fill up a lot more on the cheaper stuff if that's what you choose to do. In terms of health, probably about the same. Maybe yeah. you're not as fancy of a person if you're eating hamburgers. <laughs> so get over that. So yeah. <laughs> and then if you're wanting to put on avocado airs, or something. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Make it fancy. Make, make it, it fancy for make yourself. Fancy. Yeah, make some cowboy burgers. Chop up some uh, bacon or some other types of meats and combine mm -hmm. them in there with a little bit of onions or chives and garlic and make it interesting. Uh, show, show off that way. You don't have to show off by having the fanciest, most expensive cut. And in a lot of cases, the fanciest, most expensive cuts aren't the best tasting. They're the best looking and they right. say they're the fanciest, but I'll take the chicken drumstick all day compared okay. to the boneless, skinless chicken breast all day. Every time I'll take the cheaper one all, all day. Yeah, even all if they day. were the same price all yeah. day. You know, it's a, my my latest hack I've been doing with my meatballs, and this might be a little sacrilegious to the Italians out there, but you know what? We're already full of sacrilege because we're cutting out flour and you know breadcrumbs from the meatballs. So, yeah, I have been and pasta from the pasta sauce. and pasta from the pasta sauce. So, <laughs> yeah, so I have been mincing salami, maybe like three or four salami slices just mincing it and putting it in the meatballs and it just Ooh. adding pork products to pretty much anything. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. But it's so good. And it's just like a next, it's like, it's, it's like having eaten my fair share of meatballs, burgers, meatloafs, you yeah. name it. I, I, I need to find ways to change it up for myself. And so that's, yeah. that's one hack I've been doing. So I want to ask you something. So I know you're the coach of coaches. You're the wild diet guy. You're the fat burning man. I was thinking about this concept with you and everything that you've witnessed, because now we've been in this game a long time. Yeah. And I want to hear from you some things that you've witnessed over the years. Let me break this down. How, what are some things that you've seen that are working? And then what are some things that you're seeing with people? Because you're the coach of coaches. How are people getting in their own way still? Because I would like to, I would like to bring the audience to a little bit of like self-reflection perhaps. <laughs> Like, yeah. what are some ways we're still getting in our own way with food, with exercise, with lifestyle, anything like that that you want to touch on that would would help us go, oh, crap, that's me. I need to I need to tweak on that. Well, one thing and I'm sure this happens to you, too, is uh, you and Vinny, especially because you guys have been at this for for a long time, as you mentioned. But people will uh, they'll be like, oh, my God. I've been following you for 10 years and I remember finding your show back in your podcast back in 2012. And, you know, I lost 57 pounds and it just seemed like it came right off and it was, it wasn't that hard, but then, you know, I kind of fell off a little bit in the past year or two and I gained 20 yes. or 30 pounds back and I'm, yes. you know, eating some fast food again. I'm, I'm eating some grains and well, what should I do? And like I've gotten this question, I don't know how many hundreds of times, thousands yes. of times or whatever yes. over the years. And what should I do? And it's like, well, come back over here. This do what works again. <laughs> you just have to what, what is it figure that, out what, how to do what, is well, it that thing where they're trying to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that or, or and I think it just sneaks in and you forget exactly which things. And this happens to me too, like with dairy, for example. Like I know or I knew why I shouldn't eat dairy. You know, and and why my wife shouldn't, who has even, you know, more problems, generally speaking, with with some foods like dairy than I do, like I can get away with maybe eating it a little more often or or uh, I might not puff up right away, but I still do somewhat. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. now that the years have ticked by for all of us, Ugh. I probably have less wiggle room as, as far as that goes. But, you know, if you go back to the original source work of even 
your your books, your cookbooks, Vinny's work, my work, and, and the things that we've been talking about for years, the closer that you get to sticking to that meat and vegetables and no other processed food, you know, moderating and dialing down the dairy and those simple things, it it pretty much works unless there's another part of your lifestyle that's out of whack, like your mm -hmm. sleep or your stress. And so if you if you find that you are really sticking to it and it's not working anymore, then that's almost a different thing. But what what most people are doing, I think, is you allow what happens to us is like we'll go on this nice streak of eating the meat and veggies for a while. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you go on vacation and then, I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have some pizza and we'll have some, some cake. And then since you're on the road, it's kind of hard to like pack up all those foods. You don't have access to your kitchen. So let's just get some cheese to snack on that because we love sheep's cheese and we love goat's cheese and we love other kinds of cheese. And then all of a sudden, half your daily calories are coming from cheese and dairy, even though it's the thing that you're trying yeah. to moderate. But you forgot that you were trying to do that. And this is kind of your new little plan even you go back home and and now the next time you're at the grocery store you're getting all the cheeses instead of the meats right because it's just like oh, oh i know i love cheese and i'm totally. kind of eating this now i'm on this this ride and it doesn't have to be cheese it could be kind of anything it's like oh i love overnight oats let's go and get eight of them because like i know i can get away with a little bit so i think part of it is that is when you first find this lifestyle you're like all right i'll commit to see if it works and then it starts working right away because you're strict about it and you're getting rid of all that bad stuff or you're working on some autoimmune issue and you're being really strictly right. uh, consistent with it for a while. And those results start to pile on themselves and you see it working. So it's easier to stick to it. So if you're a little haphazard about it or you let the other stuff creep in and it's not quite working as well anymore and you've already gained some of the weight back, you're like, well, why am I even doing this? Why am I even trying it off? It's not really working. So I think it's that gray area that like kind of mm -hmm. grows so you people. just have to be honest with yourself. Some of it is that self-evaluation. And then if it's that. <laughs> but then as you know, too, it's like stress and sleep can destroy yeah. anything you're doing with your life. Overtraining, too. It's like if I were still running uh, you know, 30 or 50 miles a week, like I was when I first started all this, I might be a complete wreck at my age now, depending on how I was fueling and how much glycogen I was trying to reload with bad carbs and that sort of thing for the sake of performance. So for everyone, it's a little bit different, but I think it's really the growth of that gray area. And most people can correct that by going back to the books that they already have, not the internet. Don't go back to the internet and like surf TikTok or something and try to find the answer. Oh God. <laughs> go back. You're going to find some crazy stuff on TikTok. Oh, it's it's just the worst. The internet is the worst now. I didn't think it could continuously get worse. <laughs> worse. But right. the, since like the mid 20, 2010, so like somewhere around like 2016, 2017, it seemed like we were really getting some work done. And people we're really were really dialing it. in that whole internet thing. It was all dialed in. And then just pfft, it's uh. It's a complete mess now, but people can go back to the original source material and I think they can get some great results once again by simplifying, not trying to overcomplicate or finding the new things. How long would you ask people to give that strict time? Yeah. Like, I don't want to say time limit because I, I, I never want to give the idea that like, well, if you just do it for 60 days, then you're free yeah. to eat however you want, guys. You've achieved your final form. It's That's less how that about works. It's it's even more about shopping for the food, I think, than it is about mm. what you plan to do that week. Because if you plan to eat really well that week or really clean, but all you have is Ben and Jerry's and all this all the, this bread in the fridge and whatever else, you know, your roommate or your wife or your partner or your kids brought into the house or the neighbors, whatever it was. If you just have a bunch of that stuff around, you're going to eat it. That's how humans work. Or that's yeah. that's certainly how I work and a lot of the people who I've I've worked with. But if you decide to get strict about it when you're shopping for food, uh, then it becomes a lot easier because if you shop once a week or once every couple of weeks or even every few days, you could totally dial it in because you don't have the other bad options around anymore. And so for most people, I would say one thing that's actually been really useful for us is I have a tendency <laughs> to want to go out and grab all the new and interesting things in the grocery store. And I oh, love, yeah. I, I like shopping for food, which is kind of a weird thing for a lot of guys don't. I know that you probably do. I and, do. And well, I do. And I'm, I'm always tell, I always tell my husband, I was like, I don't go buy shoes or handbags. I'd yeah. rather go to the grocery store and find something cool and be like, look at this new spice mix or whatever. Yeah. 
and it's great fun, but you can definitely get all sorts of garbage that way too and get some stuff that's not particularly good for you. And, or it's just like, oh, I know that I really like this. I know I shouldn't get it, but I'm going to get it anyway. Right. And, you know, it's your favorite comfort food. And so if you can actually shop online, which now has, has become another way to mm. save time and money, we could even do that here in Texas at like the local grocery stores offer that for either free or like $3. It saves an hour. Usually I go shopping with my wife, so it saves uh, you know, Two both of our time, time essentially right, yeah. for an hour of both people's time. And when you're running a business, especially just the two of you, that's really yeah. important time. Yeah. It's definitely worth three dollars. But more importantly, it's easier to shop online and not buy the bad stuff because you're not hungry, hopefully, if you're shopping online. And then when you go and pick it up, you're not tempted to go reach for the Pop Tarts or the cereal or whatever it is that you might if you're walking down that aisle in the grocery store. So shopping online and and shopping for the things that are very good for you and not getting the bad stuff is probably the best possible thing that you could do. And it doesn't take more than a few weeks to realize, oh my God, this is, this is working. Like if we take out some of the worst stuff, I can see it in my face, like within a couple of days, <laughs> if I'm honest about it, and yep. especially, you know, being on podcasts and being on camera and stuff like that. I can tell if I had a bottle yeah. of wine the night before I can oh, yeah. tell and your, it's <laughs> when your eyes are like this <laughs> scrunched right. together. Yeah. Oh yeah. Me too. <laughs> so sure. it doesn't take, it doesn't take long when people start doing what's right again and kind of clean it up, but then it's the sticking to it that makes it hard and it's not coloring outside the lines from time to time that that completely derails people but it's that sneaking in of the gray area to the everyday that i think really does derail people because it's the the little things that add yes. up over time i i think that we've all done that where we're like okay i'm going to do 2 weeks 30 days 6 whatever it is and you do it and then once that time period is over with you allow yourself a little thing from time to time, which I have no problem with, but then yeah. it does start happening every day. And you just have to be honest with yourself. Like I'm doing that every day. I'm stealing the yeah. fries off of his plate. Every, like every time we go to a restaurant. And then if mm -hmm. it's not that it's something, you know what I mean? So it's not like I'm doing, but that stuff is when it's a daily thing is where your body's like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we can't, we're not, we can't, you know, yeah. my husband brought home uh, some Girl Scout cookies and uh, set them on the counter. Now, I haven't had gluten intentionally in over 20 years because I have celiac, but it was an interesting thing. So I always feel like I'm never tempted by anything with gluten. I'm used to just avoiding it. Yeah. And for some reason, every time, and they were sitting on the kitchen counter and every time I would walk past those things, my brain started going, God, I want, I want a cookie. I want a chocolate cookie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't even really love cookies like that's not my preferred thing and and I, but just seeing it in the house triggered that thing in my brain then i was like well i could have a square of dark chocolate or yeah a piece of peanut butter a little bit of peanut butter or almond butter on the top and it just my brain started to go into that like like a beautiful mind where it's like all these facts and making figures. all like, the connections what can i do to make the low carb version of that thing <laughs> and it's trickery you know i'm tricking it myself is. yeah and yeah and how do you help people? Because you have to coach people with their mindset. How do you help people with mindset with stuff like that? Mm -hmm. It's it's a hard one because You're like, like knock it off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can say no and don't do it, yeah. but that's not the problem. The problem is is almost always that they're not even shopping for it, right? It, they just see it. You yeah. know, whether it's the cookies on the counter, it's the Ben and Jerry's in the fridge, it's mm -hmm. something in the cupboard. Once our brain knows that it's there, it doesn't unsee that. And it's, it's just it kind is. of setting off those cravings the and that trigger, thing. like you said, yeah. the addiction. And we all have it. So, um, for example, the way that I keep myself playing instruments is by having the instruments around so I can see them. Well, it's like I, there's a guitar right there, there's so a piano good. right here. And so I play them because they're out. And if they're in the case i tend not to and i noticed that same thing with video games but the opposite it's like if the if the playstation controller is on the coffee table we'll pick it up and we'll play that night and if it's yes, we will in, if it's like if it's four feet um over in some cupboard and we can't see it we're not going to play that night uh nine times out of ten anyway and so i think Part of it is realizing that we're all just stupid monkeys and we have <laughs> we to, <are. laughs> we have to account for that in one way or another, whether, whether it's 
trying to replace a bad behavior or a bad craving with something good, or it's just, you know, for some people you can't like alcoholics don't tend to go out to bars as much as people who aren't alcoholics. Right. And so with food addiction, which we're pretty much all susceptible to, to a lesser degree for most people than alcoholics, you know, struggle with alcohol, but we all have this thing and we're kind of walking into a bar every day, uh, whether we're alcoholics or not. And, And so the more that you can massage your environment to make sure that you're not having to struggle with that, the better you're going to be. But I mean, how realistic is that with a family? Well, you can set up different cupboards, you know, it it sounds, it sounds silly, but this is what actually works for our brains and our minds is get it out of your sight and have your own little slice of the cupboard where you have your, your foods that you know that you're, that are going to serve you when you get hungry. And maybe the other part of the cupboard that you put a lock on or you put some tape over it or just (laughs) you commit in one way that makes it inconvenient for you to go into that cupboard or you just say you know what i know uh, you're you're my husband you're my wife i know you want to eat this food this is yours if i start to eat it slap my hand just (laughs) this is yours (laughs) slap my hand get me away from it help me out turn us into a roommate situation at this moment like we're not allowed to take your food you have to get creative because we all struggle with this and you're never going to beat it for good. So it's it's more about like trying to find a way to navigate through that. How are you not going to eat the bread that's in front of you at the restaurant when you go out for some right. rehearsal dinner or right. whatever it is? Because yes, it's going to happen. Mexican restaurant. The, the, it, it's endless. It's never going to end. Never going to end. Gonna so you end. have to find cheap, a way to deal with it. Cheap food that will make you sick will be constantly put in front of your face. And sometimes it tastes really good, or it, at least it gives you the feeling that it tastes really good. So you have to figure out. I, to I would add on to that too. Yeah. If you've got a few hundred bucks to spend on your own, like self quantification, get one of those newfangled continuous glucose monitors, <gasps> eat some bad food and see what happens. Cause it's gnarly. It's gnarly. I can't wait till data. CGMs are covered by insurance. Hopefully every, it's not that far off. Everybody. It's an expense, but when you look at health expenses or even nutrition expenses, it's really not that outrageous. It's a pretty dang good bang for your buck as far as the other things. Out Talk there about go. that. But, I had a great experience using one and doing different experiments. Talk about your experience with CGMs. Yeah, really interesting because it's like you want to confirm everything that you think you know. And for the mm-hmm. most part, that did happen. Uh, some of the surprises for me were based on the way that I eat, where I'm not really sitting down and eating a large quantity of carbs, like ever. Every once in a while, I will, and I'll backload them after a big run or something, because mm-hmm. I'll run for uh, five to 10 miles. And, um, you know, if I'm doing a big one with, with sprints, I noticed that almost nothing will spike my blood sugar faster and harder than being fasted and sprinting. Or being fasted and getting mad. Oh, oh, because (laughs) you raise your cortisol? Yeah, so it spikes my blood sugar and then it crashes hard. So So your body is really, really your cortisol is making your liver release more glycogen to your organs. Is that what's happening? Well, I think so, yeah. And I would have to figure it out a little bit more because it is a bit circumstantial. But one of some of the times it happens from, I'm, stressing my body out on purpose and I'm mobilizing the glycogen and I'm doing my big athletic thing. Um, and on those days when I eat quite a few carbs, most of them kind of paleo primal friendly, but not all I'll, I'll eat overnight oats. And, um, I've, I've tried toast and other things like that, but I have kicked out even after retrying them, gluten grains tend to treat me worse than rice and oats, for example. But if I'm refeeding and having a whole bunch of coconut water, maybe some homemade treats and cookies and things like that, that are gluten-free, but but caloric and have quite a bit of sugar and other things like that, I can you get mean away like with processed or, or homemade? Usually homemade, but I've okay. tried processed too. And yep. if I just had a huge expenditure of energy, my body sops it up and it's no big deal. If right. it's a rest day or if I hadn't had a big workout that day, then my blood sugar will spike and it's bad. And once it spikes, then the rest of the day, you're chasing those cravings. It's kind of like this thing where it's totally steady and like fasting through the morning, lunchtime comes, totally cool, I'm not hungry. 
then if you break your fast, like I broke my fast one time with um, French fries, just from oh like a burger place, not a fast food place. And it was the worst, absolutely the worst. Because a tiny fried, little serving. Because it's fried, fried starch. Starch. Wow. Yeah. And when I ate a small amount of fried uh, potatoes, it was... You know, nominally speaking, it wasn't diabetic numbers or anything like that. But in terms of my relative spike and crash, it was the worst that I saw. Mm. And interestingly, when I had a whole bunch of brisket a couple of nights later with some fatty green beans uh, and scalloped potatoes, which were covered in cheese. I think they were boiled first and then cheese they were cooled, mm -hmm. re reheated. Yep, that's yeah, how tons you make of cheese, them. tons of cream. Yep, yep. Hardly had any effect on my blood sugar, even though I ate a whole bunch of them. So the quantity matters, how it's prepared matters, whether it's fried or not totally matters, and what you've done that day uh, in terms of activity and your stress right. and your sleep totally matters. So the same person eating the same food on a different day will have a completely different effect. So there's a lot that you can learn from it, but mostly it's that our all of our bodies are a little bit different. Some people can eat a sweet potato no big deal. And it's great for them. Other people eat a sweet potato and it wrecks their metabolism for the rest of the day, maybe even a couple of days. Um, drinking a couple of glasses of wine, no big deal. Drinking a whole bottle of wine over the course of a night with a full stomach of food, not that big of a deal. Yeah. Drinking a whole bottle of wine without that much food, catastrophic catastrophic for that day and the next day and the next and day. so like yep. some of these things where you hear the you know well don't drink on an empty stomach and make sure you get a, a good meal in uh we're we're very much confirmed by wearing the cgm and then i combine it with like the aura ring and i've got a garmin watch for my training and runs and that sort of thing aura ring. yeah and it's fast <laughs> this is a, a huge opportunity for people especially when you can combine those two different things because you can see when you eat those french fries or when you skip lunch and then you have a you go to happy hour but you didn't fill up your stomach it's like oh man that freaking wrecked me and if you just if you uh don't track anything and you kind of feel bad the next day you write it off as a hangover and it's just like oh yeah it makes sense that i have a hangover or something or i don't feel that well but when you see what it did to your heart rate when you see what it did to your blood sugar and then you see how your productivity is completely trash for the next two days or whatever that's that's a good reason not to do that anymore but Today also hangovers they're real young they people real. but italians they'll eat a big meal and they'll drink they wine do. all night and they seem they fine the next day a lot of them and, and they'll like, have even cello or grappa at the end of the night and then they're fine the next day so it kind of explains that a little mm -hmm. bit too where you can have your cake and eat it too sometimes in sometimes. the right way but there's a there's kind of a right way for your body and there's a wrong way for your body. And we're all a little bit different. So that's why it's important to do that. Some amount of tracking, I think. Uh, and not get obsessed with it or do it forever, but just like experiment on yourself and see what doesn't work. I was going to say, what what would you advise would be the best way in for a CGM? Like how much time should you give it? When should you start experimenting? How do you figure out your baseline? Like what do you do in case yeah. somebody's like, you know what, you guys have convinced me. I want to go and get a CGM. Yeah, well, there are a bunch of different ways to go about it there are different uh companies levels nutrisense um That's there are the a few I others I like them. yeah i like both of them and actually the device the cgm device the freestyle libre is even separate from that and has its own app and some sometimes depending on whether you have a doctor or he's he or she has set you up with a platform to order it directly sometimes you can do that and it's only a little bit over a hundred dollars i think for each 14 day sesh oh that's not bad with, uh, yeah which isn't too bad but i think usually with with nutrisense and levels and some of these other companies you commit a few hundred dollars um to 14 or 28 days sometimes even longer than that but i would say you probably don't need much more than 14 to 28 days if you take it seriously and you plan right. out your food ahead of time and you track your food too so that's that's another thing that that i do when i'm wearing it is uh so that i can go back later is and you don't have to do this in the app that comes with the CGM or anything. I just do it in my Google Calendar usually, where I'll put in what I ate that night or that day, um, and track it pretty religiously. 
while I'm wearing it so that I can go back to the data later and see what happened, how did I feel, how productive how productive was I, and how was that related to the blood sugar? But yeah, I, in just a few weeks, commit to it, kind of like doing a, a dietary challenge or a physical challenge, and see what happens because it's worth experimenting. I was really surprised by how many carbs I could put down without it being a big deal. And in fact, I felt a lot better the next day if that was a correct refuel. So mm. under eating, I, I kind of learned to appreciate under eating as a problem when I wore the CGM for That's the first time in a while. Fascinating. Right? Because I know that you talk about intermittent fasting a lot, but now, you, so how to marry these two concepts for me, the under yeah. eating versus, isn't that what intermittent fasting is? Or what, what are you, kind of distinction? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Kind of. Well, it's, it's not the answer. But it can be, from a lifestyle perspective, a stoic answer for lifestyle, you know, kind of a mm -hmm. way of making your life hard on purpose for portions of it and controlling cravings for a portion of the day. So for the most part, I think fasting works well um, as just a strategy to make you eat less often. No matter who you are, you can apply this and go for a little while without eating sometimes. And for some people, that works really well on pretty much a daily basis, 16, 8. That tends to work better for men. For women, um, it, it's really more of an individual thing because there are so many variables. But fasting <laughs> really, can work. Depending on what day of the month it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it can mm -hmm. work until it doesn't or it doesn't work and then it does and... Uh, it could cause other issues or mess with your sleep. But the way that I like to think about it is just having a mode of not eating. And for you, you know, being celiac for a couple of decades and that being a part of your life, looking at the cookie and trying to make it not food anymore. For, right. for people out there, if there's a way that you can look at an Oreo cookie and it's not food or drive by McDonald's and it's not food. Right. That's really useful. And so fasting has helped me do that for sure. But. I, I was thinking back to one of the first times I ran a marathon and uh, if you do the math and everyone's body is a little bit different, you're burning through thousands of calories and mm -hmm. normally exercise, you're not burning through even hundreds of calories. Right. It's kind of exercise is not a good way to burn through calories, but if you're running 30 miles a day or whatever, you're, yeah. you're burning through, you know, extra, say an extra 3,000 calories in addition to the 2,000 or 2,500 that you're normally burning that day. Um, so if you don't replenish that, and especially you don't replenish the muscle glycogen that you just burned through because you're running hot and fast and hard and whatever it is, you're just depleting yourself. When I didn't effectively refuel, or if I tried refueling with gluten grains, I got sick. My immune system would get trashed for the next few days after that big, long wow. training session. And this happened a number of times before I'm like, what is going on? Because I remember that happened one time and then I ran my next marathon. I'm like, okay, I don't want that to happen again. I don't think I ate enough afterwards. And then I just plowed through an enormous amount of food. And the next day I felt great. And I'm like, what is going on here? And so I think to a lesser degree, because I'm not putting in those amount of miles anymore. But to a lesser degree, I, I learned that by wearing the CGM. Because what I found was for the seven mile run, like I was talking about before, well, I'll go, I'll go for seven miles and I'll do some hill sprints in the middle of it. Really stressful on the system, especially on an empty stomach. And like I said, it, it uh, spiked my blood sugar and then it kind of does this thing where it hangs out up there and gives me like an hour or two to refuel. And if I don't, then it goes <laughs> and wow. just straight down. Mm -hmm. I get shaky. I get um, a little cranky and short. And the, the hypoglycemia to... kicks in. Exactly. But now mm -hmm. I know what hypoglycemia feels like based upon mm -hmm. seeing my seeing data. After... actually happen. Yeah. After the runs and after eating the um, French fried potatoes, which was the same effect after eating <sighs> the potatoes as after doing the hardcore run without refueling quickly enough. Uh, especially because I was doing it on an empty stomach. So that's really interesting when you can link totally how how poorly you feel to mm -hmm. something you did or didn't do, especially if you're not eating enough. I think that's extremely important. So for some of uh, the women who I've been around and worked with who have done fasting, 
now knowing what I know about the feeling and the mental state of hypoglycemia based upon the data that I've seen, it's pretty obvious in a lot of ways when someone is entering that phase of under eating, you need to refuel and it's too late. Once it's already too late, it's hard to get back to that normal level. You're kind of riding that seesaw again for the rest of the day. So how do you avoid getting hypoglycemic in the first place? Don't fast too hard, too long. Yeah. And if you are fasting, don't get stressed, right? <laughs> um, that that was the other big piece that I'll just quickly share. Because fasting is already stress. It's already stress. Yeah, and you can't just keep layering that on and expecting it to work. But yeah, I'll I'll just finish by saying one thing that really surprised me a couple of times uh, was I was not eating. It was the morning time, and I typically don't eat until noon, anyways ish, sometimes a little bit later. And one particular day, I looked at my calendar and there was like nothing really on it. Uh, I looked at my CGM data and there was this huge like spike for me and then a crash right after that in the morning. And I'm like, what? What happened there? I didn't exercise. I wasn't doing interviews. I wasn't really. Oh, I got really mad. Someone said something that I, I was going to say, you got an email like. from some D bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I something mm -hmm. and I'm not even going to say what it was because it no. wasn't it wasn't even major, but I got mad. It never is. Yeah, you, you I got get mad over dumb stuff. Yep. And that was enough to yeah. just derail my metabolism for the rest of the day. Um, and it, it, that wasn't quite as bad as like not properly refueling after a big, long workout. But uh not properly fueling after a big, long workout is probably the same thing that happens when you take on so much on your plate and you're taking the kids to school and you got to do this thing for work and then you got to get ready for lunch, but you haven't fueled yourself up. Same thing as going for a long, stupid run like I did, not refueling effectively. Right. You're just taking on too much and we do need fuel. It's just a matter of knowing how much and, and when and moderating is a really, really good thing. If you can have just a little bit of something that you love instead of way too much, it makes a big difference. That's another thing I learned. Well, I, I think this is all completely fascinating. And another way of looking at how stress, not just what you eat, but also how your stress affects your blood sugar. Because yeah. I think that fasting is so popular right now. And fasting has been having a moment for a long time. I, I, I'm not, and I'm not anti-fasting at all. In fact, I did it I have for so many years and I chose to do the thing where I wait to eat till 12 or one. And then because my lifestyle is dinner focused mm -hmm. and, um, and I finally got to the point where I was checking my blood sugar and I was like, I've been low carb for so long. How could I even have a blood sugar of 138? Yeah. At 10 AM in the morning. Yeah. How is that even possible? That's how. <laughs> and now I know that that's how. And it was shocking to me because it seemed to work for everybody else. And then I had Dr. Alexis Daniels on it because who is my I doctor. That. Yeah. Oh, I, I was talking to her and I was like, girl, why is this happening? She's like, girl, it ain't for you. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I get it now. And now I actually have to make myself make some food in the morning because I was so used to doing that. And there was something with me about carrying something about like I carry that non eating feeling throughout the morning, then I'm doing a good job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So I was giving myself the wrong kind of feedback and my body's going, no, feed me. Yeah. And so, Cause that and, works for a little while until it right. doesn't, you and, don't and realize it it's too late until it's way too late. And by the way, I kept thinking, well, I lost five pounds. Why can't I lose more weight? And I did it literally for years. You know what I mean? And not yeah. losing any weight. That's how smart our bodies are. They're we're, they're like, no, we're going to hang on to it because we're scared. We yeah. don't know what you're doing, crazy lady. And right. then the blood sugar spikes when you get the emails or whatever, you get the <laughs> phone call. That It's just so incredible to me how much it's all tied in. Our Our mental health is so tied into our physical health and how the stress matters. And in fact, the aura ring, like I learned pretty early on when I had wine or vodka, like I could tell, okay, your heart rate yeah. variability, blah, blah, blah. you know, yep. we, we get that. But then there were times when it was just like, oh no, I just had a really stressful day and my sleep was terrible. I had no alcohol for a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you had yep. one of those nights and you're like, oh, that's interesting because, and it's interesting to know it so you can parse it out. Like, what is it that's happening? 
Yes, it's usually alcohol, but also it's not yep. helping that you're really stressed. And maybe at the end of the day, you're like, screw it. I'm going to have some wine, I had a bad day or whatever, which we all do. Right. So I love that we have this conversation. I want, do you still have a minute to talk about, cause you said about spiking the, um, cortisol was, I'm sorry, spiking the blood sugar was sprinting. And then I know that you've said tiny workouts are better. And I want to hear what you mean by that, because I have the feeling something is related there and I don't know what yeah. it is, but will you, do you have time to talk about that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got, this okay, is my great. last one of the day. So keep okay, me as perfect. long as you'd great. like, um, that was, yeah, I, for, I forgot to mention this earlier, but the, another big learning that I had from multiple CGM experiments was that if I am eating carbs or if I am eating something that I know is likely to spike my blood sugar a bit, then there is a fantastic difference between a rest day where you're just not doing any exercise and around the time of your meal going for a five or 10 minute walk mm. or doing 30 or 60 air squats, pumping out some push ups, doing some kettlebell swings, not all of those things, just one of those exercises so right around the time you're meal. as a method of blood sugar management. Yes. Got it. Okay. Yeah. As, as a method to open up your uh, body to receiving your liver and, and your muscle to receiving those carbs that are coming in uh, or whatever else might be spiking your blood sugar, doing something to, you don't even have to get to the point necessarily of sweating, but just doing some really minor 30 to 90 seconds of, some light to moderate activity makes a massive difference. But the best thing that most people could do is just to walk around most meal times. It, it, it's it's like you're a different person. If you look at the data, it's almost like a different body on the days that you went for that small walk right around the time, especially after you eat um, right around that time. Uh, it almost took the spikes away for me, mm. even when I should have really had one, it, it kind of took it away. And then, to, to also jump on your last point, drinking alcohol, you can see and usually has a moderately negative effect or a massively negative effect if there's a lot of it, but it was almost the same as sugar. Sugar and alcohol looked pretty much the same if I was having a lot of it. And um, you're even saying distilled alcohols. Yes. Not yeah, just I wine mean, or, well, I don't drink beer, so I don't even know what the comparison would be, but wine or I mean, Actually, wine definitely. Beer, wine has residual sugar in it, but distilled yeah. alcohol has allegedly zero grams of carbs. And allegedly, if you're just putting in soda and a squeeze of lime juice, you shouldn't be spiking anything, right? But I guess you are. Kind of, or right. it'll disrupt your physiology the following day. But there's a big difference between between having one or two mm -hmm. and having four to six. Um, oh God, yes. Like huge difference. Um, when I say I you're a man, find... you can say one or two. I would say for a woman, one. I would say for a yeah. woman, there's two, you're already I think you're right. You're pushing it. But I did drink a whole bunch of near beers, some of them gluten containing, some of them non gluten. And I interesting near like zero alcohol beers, I right, mean. Right, right. Like the or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, but they have some ones now that that I kind of fell in love with because it's just this whole like micro brew scene that's popped up in the well, non-alcoholic cool. beer thing. That's they great. even I have some gluten-free ones as well. And those, my body seemed to just soak right up. It wasn't really a big deal. Even having one or two beers uh, wasn't so bad. I thought it would be because some mm. of them are like stouts and the sugary porters, you know, with 20 or 30 grams of oh, carbs, wow. a lot of that being sugar. Right. And I'm like, well, how could I, how could I drink that? And it's, yeah, it's why is that? Not so bad. Well, I think part of it is that the alcohol lowers your blood sugar, whether oh, it's that's wine. That's true. It does. Or the the beer, but I'm like, so how if my blood sugar isn't spiking while I'm drinking all of these sugary carbs, am I gaining weight? Am I gaining fat as this is happening? And I think the answer is yes. I think you can. <laughs> Yeah. gain a fair amount of fat and weight, right. even if you're not spiking your blood sugar, mm -hmm. or at least that's what I learned in, in this experiment. Yeah. So there are so many factors to account for it. Just because you're winning in one of them doesn't mean that you're winning in all of them. And that's the other kind of thing that you learn is you can get away with some stuff, but it's going to be the at the expense of something else. Um, if yeah. you can really enjoy having a couple of near beers and get away from the alcohol and do it sometimes, I think that's great. And I love being able to add that in and it didn't have the negative effect 
that I thought it would. Being able to have a sugary beer every once in a while and not have it completely destroy me is great. But knowing that having a six pack will absolutely destroy me for the next days makes it a lot easier not to. I mean, six beers seems bonkers it, these days. It like, sounds it sounds bonkers. I but guess. If you're, yeah, I guess if, if you're, you're hanging, it's easy to drink that much because I could drink. Let, let me put it this way. I could drink six bubblies or Waterloo's, which are now apparently completely tainted with junk and crap and are going to make me die. But so I'm I could drink throughout the day. So yeah, that's well, that's say, what it is throughout it. the day. Yeah. Yeah. Or throughout an afternoon or if you're at a barbecue or if you're at a football game or just something like you're at that dinner that goes on all night. It's like, right. how can you drink a bottle of wine over the course of the night? Well, because it's just like four glasses and you're there right. for six hours. And so that's how it happened. But there, yeah, it's, there's a magnificent difference between those things. And every once in a while, if if you're not drinking too fast and you eat enough quality food, then it's not the end of the world to enjoy that bottle of wine and, and kind of live that Italian lifestyle. But I would I would argue that it's also not optimal to do that all the time. Right. <laughs> Which no, some people say that whatever yeah. they're doing is optimal all the time. And that's just not true. I think having a diversity of experience and foods and uh, the way that we're living, like sometimes going out and and drinking a bottle of the wine, a bottle of wine over the course of a half day or a half night or whatever with your friends might be the best possible thing to get you solid sleep the rest of the week because it's worth it. You had fun on the weekend and now you're ready like Monday comes and you're going to eat right. You're going to do your workouts and you left the weekend back in the weekend. So there's no right, right correct way to go about all this. It's about learning who you are, but I think learning your um, boundaries. Yeah. And, and knowing that some of it, you can have fun with it, but moderation is a huge skill. If you can build that out, then then really use that as much as you can, because having a little bit of something delicious doesn't have to turn into some massive binge. And by the way, I will say for those listening who may be rather new to this, you might need a little more time. Yeah. And so you hear the moderation thing. You're like, but I've tried moderation. I'm like, and remember the back to the beginning of this conversation where we said, you can't, you know, this, this won't always apply. And it's always a work in progress too. Mm -hmm. Like, it's always like, you're trying to figure it out. You know, I really yeah. want to have the thing. Okay. Have the thing. Well, you know, I really want to have that thing. Okay. Have the thing. Okay. Well now I've had too much of the thing and now I have yeah. to, you have to dial it back and that's okay. And I always tell people it's part of the process because you're never going to achieve your final form, but as long as you stick mostly to it, you're going to be in much better shape. And I really and appreciate you taking the time and having the conversation with me. And, Absolutely. I love And by the way, you, if even if you're not having any carbs at dinner, going for a walk after dinner is always a good idea. Every time. Yeah. That's Every never time. you're never like you never make it you I, I challenge anybody to say a couple of things. Number one, nobody ever comes back from a walk and is like, I wish I didn't go on that walk. Yeah. And then I was gonna say something about sex, but I didn't want it to get <laughs> uh, provided that you're having sex with somebody <laughs> who wants to have sex with you. That's what I'm saying. Nobody's yeah. ever said, like, oh man, I wish I didn't do that. You're always like, yay. I'm glad yeah. I did that. Of course. That's also By true. By the way, that's it is, right? That's that's uh that's more of my messages to 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 my uh, girlfriends who are very tired and raising a lot of children <laughs> don't want to like do it, girl. Get in there. You're going to feel good about your choices. <laughs> this went off the rails. But um but having ha going for walks, having some moments with your significant other are always a good idea. Connection. Yeah. Being good to ourselves is extremely important. Knowing that this is that this can be fun and that there are, you can be a health nut and still enjoy your life is a really important thing to realize. And it's been coached out of a lot of us. Oh, that's but very true. That's I wouldn't really do it true. otherwise. We This whole health nuttery business wouldn't be worth anything if we couldn't have fun. Oh, I, I think, I think that's probably why I kind of have my last holdout temper tantrum about dairy because I feel like to me, dairy is fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> a dairy is an enjoyable thing. So from time to time, I'm going to enjoy myself with it. But for the most part, I, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I think that, um, I think that we also associate fun with junk food, with mm -hmm. alcohol, with behaviors that we know don't necessarily serve us over shopping, over sexing, over drugging, over drinking, over whatever it is that we're trying to stuff the, the void, stuff, yeah. stuff, stuff the hole, stuff the bad feelings. 
we we tend to want to do that. And I think that um, when you realize that you can be fun, have fun and enjoy your life without those behaviors, mm -hmm. that's when you're like, oh, wow. OK, this is cool. This is cool. Yeah. I can do this. Yeah. If you go on vacation, you realize that actually it is nice to do a little walk or a little exercise. <laughs> it's not yeah. just about completely laying out and doing nothing and feeling because eventually I get itchy feet and that makes me feel terrible. So maybe your vacation is a great time to overeat a little bit, over exercise a little bit yeah. and, and then oversleep a little bit, but yeah. underdo other things too. It's uh, yeah. It, I think associated don't look at emails. Fun with the <laughs> don't look at emails. God, that's the worst. Unless you really want to mess with your blood sugar. <laughs> oh God. I learned that today. I'm gonna get a CGM just to see because you know a lot of my clients are on the East Coast. And so I get some emails and I I I gotta admit, I'm I'm not like Sister Mary Margaret. I'm not calm. Right. <laughs> when I receive those emails, I'm very curious to see. Well, that's yeah, that's the other kind the of freaky. Sugar. It's freaky to me that I can. Um, I mean, I like working out hard and doing hill sprints and stuff like that, but it is punishing every time. That's kind of the point is that it's like as hard as I can go when I'm going for this, the sprints. And in terms of my body's physiology, checking my email and getting mad was almost as stressful and bad as doing the hardest thing I could do. You know, isn't that messed up? So it makes me much less likely to be on social media, it makes me much less likely to just check in with everything first thing in the morning and be like, I wonder who's going to hate on me today. Because to our bodies and our brains, it actually does put us into fight or flight uh, for, the, for the rest of the day. And it's hard to recover from that. So it is. that was a massive thing to learn. Who's going to hate on me today? <laughs> and is it you know how it is oh i know i know <laughs> my my husband got off of uh facebook a couple years ago and i was like what's that like he's like i don't even think about it I'm like really yeah it sounds like a magical place to be it's like <laughs> Which, me with you know Instagram. we're choosing to be on it we have businesses and we're choosing to be on it. i get that i'm not trying to say like i'm some victim to social media i'm not i yeah. i know that i'm making this choice but i'm also like I'm also like, that's, that's just interesting to see because there's also a part of it's like, well, you don't load it. Like I did do the thing where I disabled all the notifications mm -hmm. from all the socials. So I will not see anything happening with any of them unless I go into the app purposefully to look at stuff and reply to comments. So I, yeah. for me, for my sanity, that's what works for me. People get mad that I don't reply quickly, but that's just right. what I need to do for I would suggest that everyone turn off all of your notifications for almost anything, unless it's mission critical, which Facebook isn't, you know, Instagram isn't, I haven't yeah. had Instagram for a year now since they last deleted me. So it's like only been you? better. Oh yeah. Yeah. 40,000 followers deleted so every post dumb. that I've ever come Why? out with in the last 10 years. I do not know. They did not say. <laughs> and so it's one of those things where it's, it's kind of befuddling and bizarre, yeah. but has been a gift in disguise because it's like, it oh, I, I remembered that I kind of hated it for years before that, too. And I took a year off from Instagram back in like 2016 or 17. I don't even remember. And I don't miss it. Yeah. I still hop on some of them sometimes, but they're becoming worse and worse. And now that the AI bots are on there and kind of absorbing everything the entire internet you don't even know if it's a real person a real voice a real face and so if that's going to be winning which i think it will because now you know instagram <laughs> and, and social media has become this vapid wasteland of everyone trying to be exactly like the other bot like right. the next butt model or someone who just right. doesn't even look real to begin with the ai fake account bots will win every time in that sort of world. So what are we even doing there? If it's making people completely unhappy, according to the data, yeah. increasing depression, anxiety, and all these things, no one's learning anything. And now it's populated by a bunch of fake people. <laughs> what are we even doing? What are we like, doing? Well, let's have a backyard barbecue instead. Let's have a backyard barbecue. Let's That's what risk I think. it. You can have your near beers. Good luck. Whatever. I'll have a couple of near beers. <laughs> Not that I'm judging. I just okay. We you. can have I a bottle of you. wine. We'll just okay, have to great. share it. I'll bring. I'll bring the Pinot. You bring the near beers. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> there is a way to have your cake and eat it too. And I there's. I, I hope people can learn from listening today that there are lots of way to have fun by being yes. a health nut. I love it. How to have fun. That's the title of the episode. How to have fun by being a health nut. Beautiful.
Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's always great chatting with you, Anna. Well, I wish we could do it much more often. Where can people find you then? If if you're not on Instagram, how do you even exist? I'm just kidding. I, I still have where this ancient thing. Where would you like people thing. to find you? It's an ancient thing called a hmm. website. What? <laughs> well, it's uh, what? fatburningman.com. It's also the name of the podcast, Fat Burning Man. And there are lovely people like Anna <gasps> who show up on there and, and share their knowledge. And uh, if you are going to spend time on the internet, the way that I like to do it, not that this is the right way, but it, it seems to be the least damaging to my blood sugar, is listening to long-form interviews with people you know or trust or or have can vibe with in one way or another and going to old school websites every once in a while but mostly steering clear of all of the feeds you know the the feeds and the algorithm stuff i try to stay and the notifications i try to stay as far from that as i possibly can but i uh if people email me you know if they just join the newsletter and email me i respond to almost every single one yeah. like i still like to vibe with people on our own turf to the extent that we can. And there are still so many ways to do that. The best part of social media is that they're all just kind of messaging, messaging apps anyway, and you can get That's in touch true. with people, but it matters more if they're real people and you're not messaging with some bots. <laughs> people are always shocked because I respond to emails. They're, they're literally yeah. shocked. And I'm always like, and then sometimes I have learned though, because I'll write a big, long response. Cause I'm all worried about somebody writing a thing. I'm struggling with this thing. I'm like, that's all right. I got to, da, 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 da. and then they never write back. And I'm like, Hey, <laughs> I wrote you back. You never, you didn't say anything. It was yeah. Like, yeah. It happens. I know they, they got overwhelmed by all great. the information you gave <laughs> them. That's what we do. Settle down lady. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's true. They're like, shut up. Yeah. Shut up. I just wanted you to tell me what I wanted to hear. Not all that. <laughs> exactly. I get it. Where's I the pat it. on the back? Yeah. Well, Abel and I are patting you all on the back. Yes, we are. Hanging out with us for the past hour. Thank you for being here, Abel. I can't I can't thank you enough. Please send my love to Allison. And, I will. Um, and um, I'll see you one day in the land of meats. Let me, let me it stop will be this so recording. much fun. We are the done recording. It will be fine. <laughs>